unmute yourself and ask a question. So whatever you feel comfortable with. All right. And then I'm going to be talking about some different links, um, some different resources and blog posts. And I'll put all those links in the chat at the end because it's like it's too hard for me to do it while I'm presenting. All right. So let's get started. All right, so today we're talking about easy food preserving canning free. So put in the chat, how long have mm -hmm. you pre been preserving food? So a couple people have already uh, talked about that, that they haven't preserved food yet. That's why they're here. But some people I bet have been preserving food for a long time. So um, put in the chat how long you've been preserving food. And then I think a couple of people, Liz, are, are not, are unmuted because I can hear a little background noise. So somebody said a few years, uh, not at all, four years. All our lives. All right. Five years ago. That's great. All right. I've been preserving food about as long as I've been gardening, so almost 20 years. So how I became a food preserver. So um, a lot of people, because I teach gardening and I have a big garden, a lot of people assume that I grew up on a farm or a garden, especially when you live in Wisconsin, a lot of people have agricultural roots. But I actually grew up in the opposite of a farm, which is a row home in Philadelphia. So we, did, we didn't have a yard. That's not actually my house. So we didn't really have any grass. We didn't have a yard. I didn't know anyone who gardened, and I don't even think I knew gardening was something that people did. Um, so when I was 26, I ended up deciding that I wanted to learn how to grow food. I don't know where those thoughts came from now looking back, but they came, and I decided to become an intern on a farm in Missouri. So I moved from a big city to a town of, in Northeastern Missouri of 100 people. And needless to say, it was a huge shock. <laughs> I did not know how to live in a rural area. There's many things that, that were new, including gardening and food preserving. Um, my, I actually met my now husband there and we ended up shacking up in this little, we always say that we lived in a tiny house before tiny houses were cool. So this is a little 90 square foot cabin that we lived in. No electricity, no running water, but it was really fun. Uh, and then that's the first garden that we had. You can see the, the cabin is in that back right hand corner. Our first garden, very artistic, we made it into a circle, but there's lots of mistakes here that I can see now that I wouldn't do again. Uh, one thing is there's not really any paths in there. So when I was there, I ended up in, with a friend of mine be, being in charge of the herb garden that was for the whole community. So there's a bunch of people that lived on this farm. Um, and then, and that's kind of where I started to learn how to garden. And I think for many of us, gardening go, goes hand in hand with food preserving because often you produce more than you can eat in the moment. And sometimes if you know a lot of other gardeners like I do, people don't even want some of the food that I offer them because they already have some in their own, from their own gardens. So instead of letting it go bad or composting it or throwing it away, kind of by necessity, you start to learn how to preserve food. This is at that farm is also where I started to learn how to preserve food. This was our outdoor kitchen and it had a wood stove. You can see the, the two, the wood the stove pipe and we actually did all our canning outside on a wood stove so it was a lot of work and we mostly just did canning and then we would free some things from um, from the herb garden so eventually I left there and I well <laughs> this is by one of my favorite um, artist Nikki McClure and this is all paper cut so she uses an exacto knife to make these images and I saw this photo and I thought there is this, this romanticism around canning where there's all, all these jars that are done. It looks like they're, the husband and wife are kissing and they're about to turn off the light. And I thought, yeah, my husband and I never looked like that after a, a, an evening of, or a day, a day of canning. We're usually like sweaty and the kitchen looks like a bomb exploded in it. And sometimes, you know, it's kind of hot and probably grouchy and maybe we got in a couple little fights. So we're usually not 
romantically kissing at the end of <laughs> end of a day of canning. So what when I learned that that food preserving, when I first learned about it, it was all about canning. And I thought, eh, it's a lot of work. I don't know if I want to preserve food. Um, I don't know if I want to spend the whole summer canning. So over the years, I've started to figure out there's got to be some easier ways to put food away that, that isn't just canning. So I tried lots of different things, did some experimenting and researching and and trying different things in my kitchen and I started to discover different ways that, that I thought were a lot easier than canning and I would start to tell friends and other people I know other gardeners and they would say oh I didn't know you could do that oh I, I really only thought canning was what food preserving was all about so I ended up writing a book called super easy food preserving where I talk about uh, the easiest and quickest way to get things into preservation besides canning and so that's what we're going to talk about today some examples and some different categories and how you can think about food. So this is, I eventually did leave that farm. I don't live in Northeast Missouri anymore. I, I ended up in Madison, Wisconsin. I live in the city, but I have a pretty big lot. Um, and this is my house with my garden. I have a front yard vegetable garden and then a perennial garden between the street and my vegetable garden. Another shot from the summertime. And then my garden also wraps around the side of my house, which is the south side. So I kind of have two big sections of vegetable garden, about 1,600 square feet. There, there it is, the side of the house. And so with a garden that big, I definitely end up with a lot of extra food. I share food with friends and, and neighbors, uh, but I still have more food than I could possibly eat. So I definitely put away food for the winter. This is some of my colorful harvest. A few more harvest pictures. I like taking pictures of harvest because it's so colorful. All right, so my business is a creative vegetable gardener and I'm, I'm a garden educator in person and online. I have a website and online classes and I've written a couple of books. And my mission is really to inspire you to try new things and have more fun in your garden. So that's the goal tonight. Even if you just walk away with one thing you wanna try with food preserving, my husband often says, when I go to a class, I just wanna learn one thing. And I thought, okay, I can do that. Hopefully you walk away with something that you're excited about. So the first thing to think about before you start preserving food is to think strategically. So these questions are on the handout, um, but you want to focus on foods you can grow in your garden or buy at the local farmer's market when you're when you're answering these questions. So these are going to start to help you set your priorities, especially if you're a new food preserver. You don't want to feel overwhelmed by trying to preserve lots of different things. So I recommend that you come up with a few different priorities. So I uh, so the first one is what produce do you spend the most money on throughout the year? And if you have any answers that you want to share to these questions, just put it in chat. So what and then you can on the handout, you can print it out later and spend a little bit more time maybe thinking about these things. So what what kind of produce do people um, spend the most money on throughout the year? Specifically thinking about things that you um, you grow you can grow in your garden or get at the local farmer's market. And then what meals and snacks are a regular feature of your family's diet? So. Uh, we eat, my husband actually eats a lot of rice and beans and burritos for, for lunch, for work lunch um, that he brings with him. So that would be something that's a regular feature. Uh, maybe you eat a lot of pasta, maybe you like a lot of pesto. Maybe, I have a smoothie every morning for breakfast, so that's a regular feature, a daily feature. Uh, and then which of these foods provide the highest value when preserved? So another way to think about it is what's expensive to buy at the grocery store out of season? So I feel like, yeah, there's like red peppers. It, it really depends on where you shop and whether you like to eat organic or not, but red peppers can be really expensive. Um, sometimes I find garlic it can be, organic garlic can be expensive and it's usually not as good as the garlic that I can grow in my own garden. Um, any kind of specialty like 
colorful carrots or um, interesting eggplant or some of those things you can't even find at the grocery store, but sometimes they can get be more expensive. And then which vegetables are easy to preserve for out of season use? So if you, anybody has some input of any of those questions, feel like, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, so people said money, peppers and tomatoes can be expensive. Um, lettuce, peppers, cherry, tomatoes, onions, uh, and somebody likes to preserve hot peppers. I do too, yeah. All right, so you can take some time uh, later and really think about those questions which are on the handout if you want to refer back to them and then you're going to come up with your top five priorities and if you're an experienced food preserver you might already have your priorities or maybe you want your top 10 priorities. Uh, some of my priorities are I like to preserve red peppers because uh, we use them in a lot of dishes that we cook in the winter and I find them to be expensive during the winter especially at our local food co-op. Uh, winter squash, also I love having all winter long. I make a lot of pesto and herb sauces that make it easy to throw dinner together. Tomatoes, which we're gonna talk about later in this class. And then blueberries, because I eat a smoothie every morning for breakfast. Um, and, I, and blueberries are really my favorite, my favorite ingredient in my smoothies. So with blueberries, that's, it's actually not the only thing in this, in these pictures, but it is one of the things that I preserve, but I do not grow. So in the past, I used to, I don't know why, but I had this tunnel vision that I was only preserving things that I grew in my own garden. But then I would still go to the farmer's market sometimes to buy things to eat that I didn't grow in my garden, like cantaloupe or corn or watermelon. And then one day I was at the farmer's market and I saw someone selling broccoli for really inexpensive, like $2 a pound. And I bought six pounds, a whole big bags worth. And I went home and I froze the broccoli. And I thought, oh my gosh, that was so much easier than growing a bunch of broccoli, which takes up a lot of room and it takes a long time. And I thought, I don't have to preserve, I don't have to grow everything I preserve. And that was a huge light bulb moment for me where I realized, yes, I have a big garden, but I still don't grow everything that I eat. So I don't have to grow everything I preserve. I can go to the farmer's market or a you pick farm, or I've even gone to produce auctions and buy some of the things that I preserve. And sometimes that's less work than trying to grow it yourself. Um, I don't do a lot of canning, but my husband and I do like to can salsa. And we did that last weekend. And I just ordered 25 pounds of tomatoes from the farmer's market. I have tomato plants, but I wasn't sure I was gonna have enough to do a big canning round. So I just ordered some and that just, it made it a lot easier than, ha than having double the amount of tomato plants. I decided, eh, I'll just order some tomatoes. So blueberries is something that I go pick every year from a blueberry farm in Wisconsin. And I pick as much as humanly possible in three hours, which I've only ever picked about 18 pounds. I can't beat that record yet. Uh, and then I freeze them all for smoothies for the winter. So again, I'm not gonna grow blueberries. I don't have room in my yard and they're kind of finicky. So I'll just go pick them. And winter squash is another example. I don't grow a ton of winter squash, but I do like to have it for the winter. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about in this class how you can store it so that you can eat it all winter long. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the three quickest and easy, actually it's, I added one, so now it's four. The four quickest and easiest ways to preserve food. So three of them, fresh fridge and freezer, are in the, my book, and then I added another one that I've been doing since I uh, wrote that book. So anybody, if, if you have any questions that come up, feel free to put them in the chat. And I have a couple of times built in throughout the class that I'll answer some questions. Um, somebody asked, where do you get blueberries to preserve? Uh, I'll put it in here. I go to the berry farmer in Baraboo, Wisconsin. If you don't live near me, um, look, you might be able to find a blueberry you pick farm in your area. Um, 
and it's actually really fun. It's kind of a fun tradition. I always go with the same friend and we just chat the whole time for three hours and pick blueberries. Um, they are not organic. They use integrated pest management, but there are, there are one or two, there, there's actually only one farm I know of in this area um, that grows organic blueberries. But, uh, and the best time to get blueberries in Madison is about mid-July, usually around the 12th or 12th to the 15th, somewhere around there is when I go pick. But they usually will say on the You Pick Farms website. All right, people are excited about blueberries. <laughs> Me too, they're a fun thing to have. And they taste way better than, than the blueberries that you can buy at the grocery store in frozen bags. All right, so first we're gonna talk about um, fresh, how to store things fresh. So this is really the easiest way to um, preserve food. So this is always my first choice. Can I store something kept in its natural state in a cool, dry place in your house? So something that I don't really have to chop or cook or do anything to before storing it. Um, you could something, things that you can store in a basement, a semi-warm garage, a cold room, or a closet. So basically, a lot of vegetables that you can store fresh like to be in the coldest place possible that's not freezing. So at my house, that's the basement. We have an unfinished basement. It gets actually really cold in the winter. We don't really hang out down there, and it's got a, a nice closet without any windows that we, we call the root cellar. It's not actually a root cellar. Uh, but that's where we store a lot of our food. I had a, uh, somebody I knew, a coworker, who used her chili guest room and she stored a lot of onions and garlic and things like that over the winter because if, if you didn't grow up in Wisconsin and you have family that lives in other states, like I do, and they live in Pennsylvania, they do not come and visit you in the winter in Wisconsin. So your guest room does not get a lot of use because they're afraid of winter in Wisconsin. So one thing that you can store fresh, and this is one of my favorite things to store, is garlic. I usually grow about 220 garlic in my garden. I save some for planting seed that fall, and the rest I hang in my garage so that it uh, dries. Here it is drying in the garage from the rafters. And then I pack it into boxes. I just got these from the local grocery store. They're just wax boxes. I put a some paper underneath so that any kind of soil doesn't fall through. And then I store them in my basement. I have another picture of that later. Uh, and usually we're eating our own garlic almost until the next garlic season, the next July, although by that time it does start to get a little less potent. Sometimes it sprouts a little bit, but there are things that you can do like freezing, freezing garlic to, to get it to go a little bit longer. But that's a great easy one to start with if you live in a cold climate. Uh, garlic is a, incredibly easy to grow and you can plant it in fall. Uh, I have a lot of blog posts and some videos on my website about exactly how to plant garlic, how to, how to choose the right variety, especially for storage. Um, so you can find those on my website. Some fun, they're some of my most popular blog posts. And then onions are the cousin to, bro to garlic, very similar, um, also fairly easy to grow, a little bit more tricky. Um, that's also one of my most popular blog posts, how to grow awesome onions. So if you've struggled with onions, uh, I have a lot of tips. There's some very specific things you can do to, to grow pretty great onions. Um, I usually, this year I grew 415 onions uh, and then I harvest them pile them up in this wheelbarrow. And then I lay them out in my, also in my garage with the garlic to dry for hmm, six weeks, two months. We just process them and put them in the basement. Same thing um, as the garlic, we kind of cut off the roots and the leaves after they're dry. And then I use these crates and put them in the basement. And that's a picture uh, of a part of my basement where we have a bunch of crates of onions and a few looks like a half bushel, it says, a few half bushels of garlic. And in our house, we cook a lot from scratch and basically everything we start cooking begins with onions and garlic in a pan with olive oil or coconut oil. Um, so we use a lot of garlic and onions. 
So those are just two examples of things that you can store fresh. Uh, garlic and onions, this is a little table from my book, Super Easy Food Preserving. Uh, potatoes are another thing that you can store, sweet potatoes, winter squash, and spinach is a little bit of a cheat, and I don't talk about it in this class, but I do have a blog post on my website that you can actually, spinach survives the winter in Wisconsin, so you can grow a great crop of fall spinach that will keep, uh, and you can harvest it for a lot of the winter, not the entire winter, but most of the winter. And then herbs, you can dry, and those are kind of like storing, they're not really storing them fresh, but it's not that much work to dry things. All right, so, and then winter squash is the last one. I love to have winter squash, especially butternut squash, but squash takes up a lot of room. It's also very susceptible to squash vine borer. I lost a few squash plants this year from that pest, pesky pest. Uh, so I decided, okay, I'm just gonna let the farmers do the work for me. And I just go to the farmer's market about this time every year. Everybody's got winter squash. It's extremely inexpensive. You can easily find organic squash. And I bring a couple crates and I load up. I generally get maybe 12 to 15 butternut squash. Sometimes I get a few acorn. They don't, they don't last as long. Um, and then I, put that all in my basement and we just eat that winter squash all winter long. Um, I think I have a picture next. Yep, here's January 26th. My husband's chopping it up and getting it ready to get roasted. We, we roast it a lot and use it in different dishes. And then here's March 3rd. We're still eating that butternut squash from the fall before. And there's a, a, a roasted butternut squash soup. I think it has coconut and it has some lentils and herbs on top. Yum. So uh, share in the chat if there's something that you like to store fresh that you already do. And then let me know if you have any questions. I'm gonna look through the chat. Somebody asked how to store potatoes. And if you know how to unmute yourself, you're also welcome to unmute yourself if you wanna ask a question. It's almost like you're in person. Uh, and you're sitting in the class, which is how we usually answer questions when we're live with each other. Um, so somebody likes to store potatoes fresh, leeks, scallions, pears, best ways to store preserve. Okay, so somebody asked about potatoes. Potatoes, um, it really depends on what potato kind of potatoes you're storing. Um, regular potatoes like to be a little bit colder and sweet potatoes like to be warm. So sweet potatoes are another, I have grown sweet potatoes in my garden, not every year. And I generally store them upstairs in my hall closet because it's a little bit warmer. Um, and I like to just spread them out. So potatoes really store best when there's not a lot of light and they're at their, their ideal temperature. So a little bit colder, uh, not, but not freezing for regular potatoes and a little bit warmer for sweet potatoes. Um, someone asked, do you wash potatoes before storing? That's a good question. I generally don't wash any produce before storing it fresh, or we're going to talk about in the fridge next. Because um, a lot of a lot of things have a waxy cuticle on them, and if you start scrubbing it, you remove it. Um, so I keep things, some dirt on them, but you want to make sure they're dry and not wet. So I like to spread things out in, in maybe only one or two layers. Also, if something goes bad, I can see it quickly and it doesn't affect everything else. Um, yeah, you could put potatoes in brown bags. I actually had a coworker that would store all her potatoes in the refrigerator. Um, I don't really have room for that, but that would be something that you could try. All right, I think that's the questions that we got. Um, so I have an email list. I'm going to post the link at the end, but you're welcome to sign up if you're not part of it already. I send out an email every Sunday morning and it has blog posts, videos, resources, and tips. I like to share little stories from my garden. So you're welcome to sign up for that and I'll post the link at the end. And then we're going to move on to fridge. So the easiest, I think, is fresh storage, but there's only a few things that you can store fresh. The next is fridge. So vegetables that can be kept for a long period of time with the aid of refrigeration. Pretty straightforward. Everybody knows what a fridge is, I'm pretty sure. 
So carrots are a great example of something that you can store in the fridge. Sometimes I see posts of people canning carrots and I just think, oh, that sounds disgusting. <laughs> Canned carrots. We had, we did that on the farm where I lived and they were always incredibly mushy. They were not good. Um, so I like to plant a fall crop of carrots. I have carrots growing in my garden right now. And I talk a lot about fall planting um, on my blog and I also have an online class that helps you figure out how to have a really great and robust fall garden. Um, so I usually, the last time I plant carrots is somewhere around July 15th. And then I, they grow all through the fall. And then here's October 22nd. I'm doing a big, gar um, sorry, uh, carrot and beet harvest. And then, December 6th, it, so I'll, I'll har sometimes I'll harvest some in October if I want to clear out a bed and get it ready for winter. But mostly I leave my carrots in outside as long as possible. So you can see in Wisconsin we already got snow on December 6th and I often joke that my neighbors drive by when I'm walking, when I'm working in the garden and it's snowing out and they say, what is she doing <laughs> in the garden? I'm often out in my garden, so I know a lot of my neighbors and I just think they probably think I'm crazy because I'm, I'm, I'm working my garden in the snow, but it's really fun to harvest once it snows. And I just dug up all those carrots because I like to leave them in the garden because it is a natural refrigerator in the fall and early winter, but you don't want to leave them in there so long that the ground freezes because then they'll turn to mush. Um, a common question I get is, what if you just cover them with a big layer of hay and straw and tarps, which you can do if you can prevent the ground from freezing, you can leave them all winter and just go out and harvest them whenever you want them. But I have found that uh, voles and mice tend to eat them in my garden. And you don't really know what's happening until you go and start harvesting and then they're all chewed up or not even there anymore. Uh, so I like to get everything out of my garden before the ground freezes, which in Madison is usually sometime in the beginning of December. I start to pay attention to the weather. And then I, I leave the soil on. So somebody asked this question. For carrots, I leave the soil on and I just pack everything into plastic bags. Now, one tip is if it's really wet, which it is sometimes when it's, when it's snowy, like that last picture, I'll spread everything out in the basement on some, uh, some newspaper and let the soil dry out that's on it a little bit and then put them into bags. So I take all the tops off, make sure they're somewhat dry, put them in plastic bags, and then put all those bags in the bottom and back of my fridge. So a lot of people ask, how do you have room in your fridge? I only have one refrigerator. It's actually not that big. It's not the biggest refrigerator you can get. I just don't have a lot in my refrigerator except for vegetables. So this would be a good excuse to, to clean out all those things in your fridge that you never use, all the condiments and things like that. So we mostly, mostly just store vegetables and leftovers in our fridge and then some condiments on the door. So I think you can probably find room. Now there are, there are only two of us in our house, so that could be part of the reason. So here's March 31st. So carrots store incredibly well in the refriger refrigerator all through the entire winter. I harvest them in December, January, February. Here's March 31st. Uh, I actually had already harvested spinach from my garden. And this is a purple carrot that I used my little grater with that we're having a salad for dinner. So March 31st, I'm still using my carrots. And usually sometime in April, we tend to eat through all of them, but they would last until April, May, potentially even until June, but we usually eat them before, all before then. And then you can do the same exact thing with beets. They're very easy to plant for the fall. They're not quite as cold hardy as carrots uh, because they, they're above ground, so you do want to harvest them before it gets too cold, but usually sometime in October I harvest mine, and then cut the tops off, leave the soil on, put them in bags and they last a really long time as well. I found beets that we kind of lost in the fridge sometimes the next summer and they still look fine. So they're really, really great for storage. So this is also the chart from my book. Um, we talked about beets and carrots. Leeks and cabbage store in the fridge, not as long as beets and carrots, uh, but for a fair amount of time. So that's something that you could store in the, the fridge but you'd want to eat them um, 
probably by midwinter. And then cucumber is a little bit of cheat that I talked about in the gart in the book is that a lot of times I used to make uh, refrigerator pickles and then store those in the fridge for most of the winter. But now, and we'll talk about this that as the fourth thing, I do a lot of fermenting. And so most of my cucumbers are fermented into pickles, and then those last in the fridge for up to a year. But we always eat them a lot quicker than that. All right, so does anybody have anything that they like to store in the fridge? Leave it in the chat. And let me know if you have any questions. And you can unmute yourself if you're brave and you, and you wanna ask me a question. Uh, or you can ask a question in the chat about anything that we talked about so far. I only answer questions about gardening or food preserving. I can't help you with anything else. <laughs> um, scallions stored like onions. Is that, I'm not sure if that's a question or, scallions don't tend to, uh, oh, there you go. <laughs> scallions that will, are very different than onions. So they need to be stored in the fridge. And actually I, I have seen people chop the scallions and put them in little jars or bags and put them in the freezer to preserve. I've seen people do that with onion chives and scallions. Um, scallions are also incredibly frost hardy. So you can actually leave them in the garden. I've actually had them over winter in my garden in Madison that they survive the winter and they start growing again in the spring. So you can, you can leave them in, in your garden and just harvest them from your garden for, for very far into the fall and early winter. Um, and then if you have too many, um, I, would, I would freeze them, chop them and freeze them. Favorite way to save apples? You know, I don't see, I have frozen apples before. I know people dehydrate apples if you have a food dehydrator. I've cooked them down and made applesauce and froze that. You can also can that. If anybody else has a favorite way to save apples, feel free to put that in the chat. Um, yeah, we mostly, we mostly buy apples from the farmer's market here and they're available until pretty far into the winter. So somebody said when they keep veggies covered in plastic in the fridge, they sweat and become mushy. Uh, even within a few weeks. One thing that you can do is poke a few holes in the bag, which I have done, to let out some of that condensation. So I would try that as a first step. Um, and then spinach and greens, if they're, if they're turning mushy in a bag, it's probably because there's too much moisture in there. Sometimes I'll put um, a, like a towel or a rag, or you can put a couple paper towels in there to soak up some of the moisture. And someone said they use green bags, and that seems to work better for them. So some kind of veggie storage bag. All right. So moving on is freezer. So vegetables that are kept pre-processed, or that are pre-processed and kept in a chest freezer. So if you were going to get serious about preserving food and you like the idea of freezing, I highly recommend getting a chest freezer. They're not very expensive and they don't use a lot of electricity. Uh, and you can store a lot of stuff in there. And it, unlike the upstairs fridge, they don't go through a defrost cycle. So you know sometimes you go into your, your refrigerator, the freezer that go, comes with your refrigerator, and the ice cream is kind of mushy or things feel like they're kind of soft, that doesn't happen in a chest freezer. It just stays at a consistent temperature. So things tend to stay at a higher quality for longer. Um, and an upright, I mean, upright, there are upright chest freezers, um, but I, and you can pack your, your upstairs freezer if you want. You'll just find that that the quality does go down, but, and you can't fit a lot in a refrigerator freezer. Um, and so for sure use that if that, if you're just freezing a few things, my sister doesn't have a garden, but she gets stuff from my garden and she freezes some of them and she just uses her freezer in her kitchen. Um, but if you want to get serious, I recommend um, an up, a chest freezer or there are upright chest freezers. All right, so tomatoes is something that a lot of people have right now. Uh, easy to have 
And it's very easy to have way more tomatoes than, than you can eat. So it's, it's also one of the most common things that people can. And I think a lot of people think that the only way to preserve tomatoes is to can them. So I want to share what I think is a much better method or equally as good if you love canning. I just chop my tomatoes up. I don't take the skins out off. I don't get rid of the seeds. It's way too much work. I just convince myself, who cares? They, I don't need to have this silky smooth tomato sauce like you get at the get at the grocery store. So, and I use paste tomatoes, cherry tomatoes. You can see the photo, green zebras, any tomato that I have. And then I put them all in a double, this long stainless steel casserole pan. And you can use a pot. This things cook down really quickly in this wide, this wide pan, which is why I use it. I got it from a restaurant supply store. They also have them online. I think it was 25 bucks. They're not very expensive. And then I put it on two, over two burners on the stove. So it cooks down a lot quicker. And then I cook it down for an hour and a half, two hours, however long I, I feel like it. Basically until it cooks some of the water off and looks more like sauce. So when you're freezing tomatoes, I know that some people freeze tomatoes raw, which I have done. If you can freeze them raw whole or we're all chopped, but you're freezing a lot of water because tomatoes have so much water. And so I found that I can fit a lot more tomatoes in the same space if I take this extra step and cook them down a little bit. So I cook them down until they look like sauce and you can see the skins and the seeds and that's fine. And then I load them into old yogurt containers or Ziploc bags and put them in the freezer. Um, I've had, you can freeze in some glass canning jars, but I still have had things break. So I've got a little shy about that. Anything that's liquidy. Uh, and then we use this in any recipe that calls for chopped canned tomatoes, whole canned tomatoes, you know, any kind of tomato product. We, I, I don't even buy canned tomato products anymore. Or you can put it in a pan with some onions and garlic and cook it down and use it for pasta sauce. Um, so, and it's, the flavor is amazing. I brought my sister some tomatoes a couple of weeks ago and she said, oh, I'm gonna cook these down and save them for winter and add them to my chili because they're so sweet and flavorful. They make the chili so good. So they taste so much more, just like she said, sweet and flavorful than any kind of canned tomato that you can get at the store. So very easy. Um, somebody asked, are these considered stewed or roasted tomatoes? Well, they're not really roasted because roasted you would put in the oven. Um, stewed, sure, I don't know exactly what <laughs> stewed tomatoes means. Uh, but yeah, they're just kind of cooked down into a sauce-ish tomato. Um, all right, so this is the chart from my book that talks about, there's a lot of things that you can freeze. This is the biggest category. And we're, oh, I'm gonna talk about one more thing that I love to freeze. But some of my favorites are, I freeze a lot of broccoli that I just buy from the farmer's market. Um, I freeze a lot of kale, which we're gonna talk about next. Uh, I freeze a lot of peppers. I grow a lot of red, orange, yellow peppers, and I also freeze hot peppers. Um, and then tomatillos, I usually, I usually roast them and cook them down into a, a, make a quick salsa and then freeze that. So some of these things can be frozen raw and some of them need to be pre-processed. So I have all those different directions in the book or you can find directions for those things online. So I just added this to this class because this has been my most popular blog post this summer on my site so I can see what blog posts people are looking at. This one's been going bonkers and it's how to freeze kale. So this is a picture from me a couple months ago and I, I have, let's see, I think I have 19 kale plants. I love growing kale. There's so many fun varieties. I grow all different kinds of varieties. Um, I usually have more than I can eat. And so often I'll just harvest a big arm load and bring it into my kitchen and chop it up. You can rinse it off if you want. If you rinse it off, you can spin it in the salad, salad spinner. 
And then I just pack it raw into uh, smaller quart Ziploc bags. I, I shove as much as I can possibly get into the bag and then I seal it. You don't have to steam it or cook it in any way. You can just freeze it raw. And then I use that kale in all kinds, of, we use it in all kinds of dishes. We'll stick it in stir fries. We'll stick it in soups. I get a little handful and put it in my smoothies every morning. Um, so super easy. And it's easy to grow a lot of kale. The kale is another one that's pretty easy to grow. Um, and so if you find yourself having too much kale right now, just start shoving it in plastic bags and stick it in your freezer. Um, so someone said, same for other greens. Yeah, you can freeze chard that way. Uh, you can freeze collards that way. The salad greens don't really freeze very well. They're really meant to, to be eaten fresh. So lettuce mix and arugula and um, I mean, you, you could, but we tend to eat those fresh. So anything that you tend to eat fresh isn't the best frozen. So kale tastes great when it's cooked and that's often how a lot of us eat it. Uh, so it's it's fine to freeze it. All right, that's a fun one to freeze. So you can freeze in lots of different containers here. I use Ziploc bags. I'm not a huge fan of plastic, uh, but I use my, my freezer bags over and over and over again. And then eventually I do get holes in them and, and I sometimes downgrade them to hold other things and then eventually throw them out. Uh, but they are really handy. I use a lot of uh, jam jars and glass jars for things that are more solid, like pest this one has pesto in it, herb sauces, things like that. I have frozen some more liquidy sauce in jars, but now there's, I have read that you're supposed to do it in wide mouth jars, things that don't have a shoulder, um, but I have had jars break, so I tend to use old plastic containers, sometimes small, and this one's actually really big. Look, that little one actually has tomato soup in it. And then these two look like they have those cooked down tomatoes, pesto, frozen peppers, frozen corn, frozen raspberries. That's from a couple of years ago. All right. So, and then this is what my chest freezer looks like on any given year. All of the jars are on the top and a lot of the bags and other containers are on the bottom. So share in the chat what you like to freeze, some of the things that you like to freeze from your garden. And then if you have a question, um, there's a couple questions that came in. Freezing jalapenos. I do freeze peppers. I try to freeze sweet and hot peppers separately so they don't get mixed up. Um, I usually just chop my peppers. Um, so I like to have things ready to use right away so I can just go into the bag or the jar, grab a handful, well depends on how spicy you like, but grab a little bit of hot peppers and throw them right in the dish. Um, but it really depends on how you use them. So that's one thing that we didn't really talk about, but think about how you're using the vegetables. I like everything to be ready to go and ready to put in to the dishes. So I do the chopping and some of the pre-processing before I put it away so that I can just, so that a lot of times in the winter when we're cooking, it's just grabbing things from the freezer and the basement and sometimes just taking handfuls of things and throwing them in a pan. Uh, and then freezing broccoli, you don't, you don't really, I haven't, I haven't had a lot of luck freezing it raw. So you want to uh, freeze it. You, I usually steam it just a little bit till it turns bright green and then put it in ice water and then dry it off and freeze it. So it's, it's really easy to overcook broccoli and then it's kind of mushy when you use it during the winter. Um, peppers, you can freeze raw. You don't need to cook them. People like to freeze peppers, sun gold tomatoes, and green beans. Ooh, this is, Lance likes to freeze orange zest. Do I make an inventory list to keep track of items in your freezer? So that's a great question. We're gonna talk about that at the end. And then do you flash freeze anything? Um, not exactly sh sure what you mean by flash freezing, um, but I, yeah, maybe you can explain that. And then how long are frozen greens good for? And we'll talk about that at the end, but generally you wanna to try to eat through your fridge, every, your, your freezer, and really most of your preserved goods, with in about a year, 
I've found that things kind of start to degrade in the, in the freezer after a year. Somebody else likes to freeze chopped basil and garlic in ice cube trays with olive oil so they can easily throw one or two into a pan for quick use when cooking. Yep, that's a great, great idea to preserve some herbs. You can do that with lots of different herbs. And then parsley, uh, I don't freeze a lot of parsley, I mostly put it in herb sauces, but uh, if you, there's a blog called A Way to Garden, and she has a blog post about uh, parsley logs. Here, I'll put that in the, so I don't have the link, but it's A Way to Garden Parsley logs. If you Google that, it'll come up. And she has a cool way to that you that you shove it all in the bottom of a bag and then roll it up and then you can chop it up. Um, that I have some friends that do it that way and love that. So check that out. Okay. So <laughs> you're welcome. Uh, all right. So great questions, everybody. Thanks for being so so active. Um, it helps make up for the fact that we're not in person in the same room and, and able to chat, but at least we can chat a little bit electronically. I miss teaching it in person. So, all right, so fermentation. This is one that is not part of my book because I started doing it after I wrote the book. Um, but it's really easy once you get the hang of it, which is why I've included it in super easy food preserving. So you're so with fermentation, you're using the natural organisms on your vegetables. So the bacteria and the yeast that live on the vegetables that come from your garden and the soil and the air. And that creates an environment that naturally preserves them. So you're you're encouraging that bacteria and that yeast in this particular environment that preserves the food, which is actually a really cool process when you when you watch it work and 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 you read about it. So you've probably heard about some of the benefits of fermentation is, and a lot of it is about the beneficial bacteria that, that is when you eat yogurt and you take probiotics, it's some of those same things that are in fermented food. So it aids in, our, in the digestion and then by those bacteria and yeast breaking down those vegetables, the vegetables get softer. They almost seem like they've been not cooked because they still are somewhat raw, but they're just softer. And that process is making the the, all the minerals and the vitamins more bioavailable to our bodies, uh, more so than eating raw food. And then it's filled with beneficial bacteria that reinforces your digestive system. So it's fascinating when you think, when you read about our intestinal system and how many different microorganisms we have living in our bodies, in that part of our body, and um, ferment, fermented food kind of helps boost that. So I'm just going to share some of the things. It's, it's there, is, there is a little bit of a process to learn. And once you learn that process, it's easily repeatable with lots of different vegetables and, and lots of different recipes. So um, I have a couple blog posts that I'll put the links to at the end of the class that I kind of talk about what you need to get started. And I have a favorite book that I recommend that it, clearly explains the process and has a lot of great recipes. It's not my book, but it's by some well-known authors um, in the fermentation world. And that's kind of how I, I suggest getting started. Because I've tried some internet recipes in the past and they haven't been that good. But this book, they're, they're really experts um, and it's, it has not steered me wrong yet. So I'm just going to share some of my favorite recipes so you can get some ideas if you don't if you're not familiar with fermenting what you can ferment. So this is a, a variation on sauerkraut. So that's a pretty common uh, fermented food. And this is called curtido, which is a Central American sauerkraut. And it's it's got cabbage, carrots, onions, garlic, red pepper, oregano, some other ingredients. And you're really just chopping and I have a mandolin. So I'm, I'm using the mandolin to get some thin slices of cabbage. And then you're just mixing it all together with some salt. And then you pack it into a jar and already by mixing it with the salt, it starts to release its natural juices and water. 
and you get that liquid going and you just pack it into, I use half gallon jars because we eat a lot of fermented goods, uh, pack it into a jar and then there's, that's is really the only special thing that you need is you, it's good to have a fermentation lid. They're pretty inexpensive and in the, in the blog post I'll share, I've tried a lot of different ones and I have a couple that I recommend if you're interested in trying out ferment, fermenting. So you pack it all in a jar, you stick a lid on it and then you just, I, we just leave it on our counter for two, three, four weeks. Kind of depends on how warm it is outside. When it's warmer, things ferment quicker. When it's colder, it takes a, a, a while. And you can just open it up periodically and taste it. And sometimes we'll say, no, nah, it's not done yet. Um, and then we'll just let it ferment for a little bit longer. But that is how easy fermenting is. There's a few other little tricks and things that you have to be aware of. Um, but yeah, once you read about them and get familiar with them, it's, it's, it's very simple. We also, if you love sour pickles, we are, we are famous for our fermented pickles. <laughs> Neighbors come over and they want to say, do you have any pickles? Can I have one? Uh, I brought my sister, I visited my sister who lives in a different state and she said, can you bring me some pickles please? And, and whenever she would eat one, she said, how come the grocery store pickles never taste this good? So if you like sour crisp pickles, I highly recommend fermenting them. Also very easy. And then this is, this is called edgy veggies. It's uh, cauliflower and jalapenos and carrots and garlic and onions that are really good on tacos. And you can make it spicy if you want or not spicy. And then I just made this a couple weeks ago. This is a red pepper salsa, which is so good. We can never make enough. It just, well, it does not last the winter, uh, but we try to make as many, as many jars as possible but it's pretty hard to have that many red peppers, even with 30 plants. And then we also love kimchi. And so we've tried our hand at making kimchi. I usually buy, you need Napa cabbage for it. So I usually buy that at the farmer's market in the spring and the fall when people are selling it. And then we make a bunch of jars of kimchi. So those are my five favorite recipes and I have, and I talk about them more in the blog post that I'll share. Curtido, pickles, kimchi, edgy veggies, and red pepper salsa. Mmm, so good. So yeah, so I have a how to start fermenting where I kind of talk about what you need and then those five what I call is no-fail recipes because they're all pretty easy and I've had a lot of success with them. All right, and who is, what about, there's a lot of folks in this class, so who else likes to ferment? Share what you like to ferment if you do. And then let me know if you have any questions about fermenting. Let's see if anything came up. So somebody want to know, is salt the only pickling ingredient? So it's, you're not actually pickling, you're fermenting. And every recipe does have salt because that's part of the process. But um, it depends. Like when you make pickles, you have to make a brine with salt and water in a, in a specific um, specific proportions to facilitate the fermentation process. So but a lot of things that also have spices in them as well. So somebody said love kimchi, love kimchi, but intimidated by fermenting. Yeah, it's, it's not, it's not difficult. So I highly recommend that you try it. Um, but you can always try it. Kimchi is a little bit more involved than sauerkraut or curtido, but not much. So you can just try a little jar and see how it turns out. Anybody else have any questions or comments about fermentation? Oh yeah, someone said they fermented Meyer lemons before. Yeah, that's a popular one, especially if you live in California where they have lots of lemons. Um, yeah, I thought that would be fun to try. Where do you purchase fermenting lids? Um, I, I recommend reading my blog posts and I talk about a couple different brands that I've tried and what I like about them and then I link to either their website I think it's mostly their websites so I'll post those two blog posts as soon as I stop sharing my screen before we end um, that's a great question I haven't found I, I tried to find some locally recently in Madison but I, I didn't have a lot of luck so online is probably the best bet all right Okay. Question. After, yeah. After you um, make a fer ferment fermented food product, do you store it in the refrigerator or uh, 
or what? Yes, great question. Thank you. I did not say that. So sometimes people ask me if then if you can it, but you do not want to can it because by that by heating up, you're going to kill all the beneficial microbes that you just encouraged in the jar. So I just store mine in the refrigerator. Um, so I would say that whole, at least half of the top of our refrigerator top shelf is usually filled with fermentation jars. The thing I love about fermentation is that it, most of the recipes say it'll last one to two years in the refrigerator. Um, I did have some friends that would keep theirs in the basement in a cold area, which is another option if you don't have room in your um, in your fridge. I know a lot of people who are older have stories of going down to their grandparents or great grandparents basement and getting sauerkraut from the big crock or someone was telling me a story how they would go and lift up the big mold layer and then stick their hand in, grab some sauerkraut or some pickles, put it in a bowl, put the mold layer back on and bring it upstairs. So for sure people used to keep those things in their root cellars and their basements. Um, I mostly keep them in my fridge but if you don't have room you could potentially keep it down the basement. It just keeps fermenting so if you put it in a cooler place it'll ferment a lot slower. So once it's done and you're happy with it you don't necessarily want it to just keep fermenting, keep fermenting. So if you keep it somewhere warm it will continue to ferment faster whereas if it's somewhere cool it'll slow down the process. So great question. All right, so it's time to wrap up. The goal of super easy food preserving is to preserve only what you can eat each year. So I have been guilty of, and only what you want to eat each year, because I have been guilty of preserving things that in the winter I think, oh, I don't want to eat that. And then it just sits in the freezer all winter and in the spring or in the summer I find it and then I compost it cauliflower would be one of those things and even even green beans and chard sometimes we haven't ended up eating so I don't really preserve those things anymore. So that's why you want to think about what your priorities are and what you're actually going to be excited to eat in the winter. That's what one of my friends said. I'm trying to think about what we, what's going to be really fun to have this winter, especially this winter because it might be really dark and really long <laughs> and really hard so how can you put away some food that is really fun to eat and it will give you some joy. So somebody asked before, well, okay, so I prefer to try to empty out my freezer, usually right before strawberry season in June, because that's the first thing I tend to freeze. So I tr we try to eat through the whole thing. We usually don't quite get it, but I'll move a bunch of stuff into the upstairs refrigerator freezer. I'll defrost it, clean it out, and then start the season again. So you don't want to preserve so much that you can never eat it. And then it ends up just getting lost in the bottom of your freezer or just goes bad or isn't very appetizing because it's really just a waste of time and energy. So what I recommend is using some simple record keeping and this is uh, a part of my book and you can easily make your own that I have a binder that I keep and I just write the year and I just, I'll put, under the item, I'll put pesto, and then I just will keep track every time I put some pesto in the freezer. And so for me, that has really made me realize how much I need of something. Like I don't really need more than 12, say 12 pestos, because then we don't eat them and and then I still have some the next pesto season. Um, and so it helps get me off the hook. I can just stop. Even if I have more basil, I don't need to do any more pesto because we've never eaten more than 15. Um, and that is also a way to keep track of what you have in your freezer. Uh, if, if you're more organized than me, sometimes people will mark off what they've eaten. I actually had a cousin that put um, chalkboard paint on the top of her freezer, the lid, and then she just wrote in chalk everything that she put in and then she would just erase it when she took it out. And I thought, oh, that's actually a pretty good idea. So. Um, I'm not quite that organized, but I do like to keep track of what I put in there, but I don't necessarily keep track of what I take out. Um, but it is easy to lose things in there, that's for sure. All right, so what we've covered tonight is preserve what you eat. So you can go back and look at those questions. They're on the handout and come up with your priorities. You don't have to grow everything you preserve, so keep that in mind. Where most of us live right now, it's the height of the harvest season. There's still summer things. We now have all the fall foods. 
uh, if you live in a colder area like Wisconsin and you, everything is at great prices. And so go to a you pick farm, go to the farmer's market. And if there's some things that you wish that you had more to preserve, just go buy them from somebody else that grew more than you. And then we talked about fresh fridge, freezer and fermentation keeping records so that we don't put away more than we really need, save some time and energy. And then we're gonna to try to eat all the food each year. So put in the chat one thing, right? Cause I said, I'm just, I just need to give you one thing that you're excited about that I'm successful. Uh, share one thing you're excited to try this year, something, something new, something different that you feel uh, inspired by, hopefully something. Uh, somebody said tomatoes, fermentation, pesto, fermentation. I'm trying to think if I'm trying anything new. I don't think I am. Oh, we, we did we did freeze some peaches. That's not terribly exciting, but I think I'm doing all my old favorites this year. Um, yeah, I cooked the tomatoes about one and a half to two hours on low-ish. Um, pickles, someone's excited about kale, freeze tomatoes and peppers, fermented pickles. We'll try fermentation. All right, I must have done a really good sales job on fermentation because <laughs> there's some people that are excited. Um, bagging and freezing kale without blanching. And then storing onions and garlic in a refrigerator. You could do that. Um, I have so many that there's no way I could do, I wouldn't have room in my fridge, but but yeah, they, I mean, they like it pretty cold and it doesn't freeze in the refrigerator. Well, my fridge does freeze once in a while, but, um, but yeah, you could do that. All right, so um, you can find out more about my book on my website. I'll also post the link. There's a print version that I actually just mail out from my house and sign the copy. And then there's also a digital version. Um, and then the libraries in our area also have some copies in including the Middleton Library. Um, so you can check that out. I think Liz put a link in the chat. And thanks for coming. This is a picture of one of a huge kale I grew one year. And I told my husband, you have to take a picture of me with this kale because it's so crazy looking. And if you stick around, I'll post a couple links in the chat. And thanks for coming, everybody. That was super fun. Um, no thank friend. you so much, Megan. This was awesome. Um, I think we all learned a lot. And thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, like, uh, Megan is going to post um, a couple more links about things that she mentioned, but um, there will be a recording of this presentation up on our website for about a week or so. Um, so if you want to go back to anything, um, just check out our website and uh, we can uh, get another, another chance to view. Thanks again, Megan. Yeah, thanks for coming, everybody. There's a link to the book. You can read more about it. The email list, you can just type in your email and you'll be added to my list. And then the two fermented food blog posts. And I have hundreds of blog posts on, on my website on, and more on food preserving. On the home page, you can actually click on a category that's preserving and it'll bring up some of the things that we talked about tonight. So thanks for coming and happy food preserving.